listening to RPV City Talk. RPV City Talk is brought to you by the City of Rancho Palos Verdes to inform the community on recent city matters. RPV City Talk is a weekly show that features the RPV Mayor, City Council, or City Employees. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Maria Sorreo filling in today for Liz Brown Swanson. And as we always do, we have our mayor here. Thank you for being with us, Mayor Jim Knight. My pleasure. And going over all of the things that are going on in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes since the last time you were here. Okay. Let's start with the 4th of July, which you and I got to celebrate together That's this right. year. That was so much fun. That and was great. It, you know, it's, it's interesting. The more people that we talk to at this event every year, it just gets bigger and bigger. And it's really becoming an event that families come to now every year in our city. Well, it's, it's a very family-friendly event. We have a whole section for kids' rides. Yes. And, of course, the pet adoption area is really fun. Great. Kids just love to come over mm -hmm. and pet the animals and they so on. They do. And then we have all the entertainment, and we have the little contests, hula hoop contests, and yes. so on. So it really is a fun. And, of course, they have the food there, too, for, for people to have lunch and so on. But uh, it's a lot of fun for kids. Yeah, it's, and I think for adults as well. And I was talking to the, the vendor that does the kettle corn, and he said that last year when he was there, it was one of his biggest Fourth of July events ever. Oh, really? So he wanted to come back, so that I was good. I didn't know that. Well, that's great. Well, yeah. we, we did have a great attendance this year. Yes. Well, well some of the things we had there were this, this, the Palos Verde Symphonic Band. Mm -hmm. They're great. And they were fantastic. Fantastic. They're wonderful. They had some great tunes they played. And then we also had a country western band called Boomer McLennan. Yes, band. He, he's very popular on oh, the hill. Oh, he must be. He, people <laughs> loved him. They, they really do. loved him, what, he, what he did and we played. Yeah. yeah. So we had entertainment all, all day long for the people. And uh, also I, what I like about it is uh, we have some booths there for our various city uh, departments. Exactly. Emergency preparedness, mm -hmm. the Parks and Rec and several other departments. And what I like about that, it's an opportunity for the residents to get to meet the staff that works right. for our city mm -hmm. and understand some of the services we have available to them. The sheriff was there with their trailer and, right. and people have an opportunity to face-to-face -face, uh, meet the individuals behind the scenes that are um, providing services to our city. Which I think is so great about the city is that we want to be involved with the community and you know meet us and, and see what they have to say as well. Absolutely. No, yeah. That's fantastic. And we had some great sponsors. We had Don Kanabi, Edco, Peninsula News, and a variety of other people that helped sponsor the event as well. Yeah, it's always great. Now, it's the beginning of the new fiscal year, and we have a new finance manager in Deborah Cullen. How long do you think it takes for somebody like that to get acclimated to that position? Well, um, she's pretty sharp. Uh, she has a great background. She was formerly director of finance at El Segundo. She was involved in finances at Long Beach. She was in the private industry uh, doing audits. And she also worked for the post office, which Ooh, was an interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, that's a background. <laughs> um, so she's sharp. She'll catch up. But this, these, it takes a while to understand the particular finances of a particular city. Right. We have some unusual uh, uh, things. Of course, we have our budget, and we have the capital improvement plan, which is typical of most cities. But mm -hmm. we also have the improvement authority. We have um, the uh, successor agency to the RDA. Those are related to the landslide. That's unique to our city. Right. So there's certain things, how, how that relates to the ACLAD, Ab Abalone Cove Landslide Abatement District, and the funding sources. She, she will need to catch up with some of the intricacies that, that are unique to our particular city. And that's a really good point because I don't think people realize that when you're coming into a position, you just think, you know, uh, it, it's about money and things like that, but mm -hmm. it's really about learning about the city. Yes, and each city has their own emphasis. They, their budgets uh, uh, have different aspects to it. Um, in our city, we don't have to have uh, her looking at a police or fire budget because that's uh, contracted out. Mm -hmm. But there's other elements that are unique to our city, as I mentioned, that, um, that she'll have to understand and catch up. But... She's very good. I, I'm, I, so far, I've, I've seen very good work from her, and I think she'll catch up very quickly. Okay, well, another big story that we've been talking about a lot is the Coastal Commission, the possible removal of the waterfalls at Trump has now ceased because of some situations there. What is, your, mm -hmm. uh, what is your information on that? Well, um, <clears throat> the situation originally when the PGA was going to have their event there, Correct. they apparently had requested that the waterfalls be removed, mm -hmm. or the, it's not part of their particular tournaments. So Trump was in the process of removing the waterfalls. He mm -hmm. got the permits from the city. The city has certain permits he has to get to remove the waterfall, but there's also the coastal permit. Right. Now normally with the city, we have a coastal specific plan of which the Coastal Commission says you can issue your own coastal permits. In this case, it's different because the Coastal Commission has issued in 1997 the coastal permit itself for, for Trump. 
So in addition to getting permits from the city, he has to go to the Coastal Commission for a permit to change um, his, his uh, conditions there at the, at the property. And in this case, uh, my understanding was he didn't do that. Okay. He, when we gave him his permits, we, we uh, um, forewarned him that he needed to get a coastal permit, and I guess he didn't do it. And so now the Coastal Commission has come back and said, no, 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 you need to get a permit for us for this change. So <clears throat> that's kind of in limbo right now. So we're just waiting to see what the Coastal Commission right. says back with all mm -hmm. that. And then as far as the PGA tournament not coming here, does that have a, any impact on our city at all? Or Well, it's, it's, it's unfortunate we don't have the PGA coming here. It would be right. nice for the city, um, especially at the uh, Trump Golf Course in Rancho Palos Verdes. Right, of course. Not in Los Angeles, in yeah. Rancho Palos that's Verdes. That's right, right here. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, it would, would have been nice to have it here, but that's something that uh, Mr. Trump and the PGA have sat down amongst them and mutually agreed to, to right. not have it and uh, that's his choice um, so um, it's it, it's not going to affect us financially in any big way but right. it would have been nice for us to have it here and maybe sometime in the future we'll, we'll Could see happen it again in the future, we'll see. Yeah. yeah now the council just started allowing volunteer police patrols um, how does that sort of work well basically <clears throat> there there are individuals in the community that <clears throat> want to contribute back to the community and the sheriff has a section which is called volunteer patrol. Okay. Um, and these are volunteers that come in, and they, what they do is they help uh, in administratively at the office down in Lomita. They also will help enforce like parking restrictions in mm -hmm. the city, citywide, um, and they may patrol neighborhoods. They may even uh, some uh, um, resident may ask that they look after their property when they're on vacation just to double check on it and check the back doors and so on. So they do a lot of things like that. And what that does is it, it relieves some duties that the, the sheriff's deputies would normally be doing, which allows the sheriff's deputies to concentrate more on maybe some more serious issues in the city and, and make sure they're around patrolling and, and uh, addressing when there's a call in, there's more of them available to, to respond and the response time goes down. So it, it helps a lot with, with making sure that our residents are safe. And now they'll be able to issue parking citations as well, is that correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. Now does this have any uh, impact on the influx of people coming to the peninsula, do you think? I don't know if we talked about it last time, but the council has implemented <clears throat> some changes to Crenshaw Boulevard. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. And they've in implemented some parking restrictions in the uh, residential areas in Del Cerro, uh, C. Vista Del Mar, and uh, Island View, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, have now some restricted parking. Problem was, there were so many people coming down to, to hike at the end of Crenshaw of the Preserve, they were flooding into the neighborhood, and there were some safety issues, especially on Crenshaw. I personally <laughs> was driving there, and I was coming out of Del Cerro, heading up toward Crest, and a woman had her door open on the right side and the cars were parked on the left side. I had to kind of go in the middle of the street to avoid her and there's a car coming down the other way. Oh, and and no. it, was, it was a... A little dicey. Dicey. And yeah. so what we've done is we've taken that right side of the road as you head north toward Crest and made that red stripe so you don't mm -hmm. park there because we, we need to make sure it's safe for people Absolutely. exiting. Absolutely. And, and the residents there and, and the people that visit both need to, right. need to have it safe. So we did that, and we put some restricted parking in the neighborhood, so their neighborhoods are not as impacted. So that we'll see how that goes. We implement it and uh, see how it goes. Well, so many people want to come here, of course, because it's a beautiful yeah, place it is to a come. Place, it's also yeah. a beautiful place to shoot uh, movies and TV right. shows. And I know that the uh, the film rates have been increased. The permits. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Well, um, <clears throat> I believe it was Mayor Pro Tem Brooks that brought this forth. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and uh, <clears throat> we. Um, we're having so many filmings happening, especially on the coastline. That yes. seems to be the, the popular place, uh, that it was beginning to kind of impact traffic mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and we, we just wanted to kind of see how what other cities are doing, especially Malibu, right. who has also a coastline mm -hmm. that, that's very popular for, for filming. And we found that our fees were way out of line with, with what other cities are doing. So much we decided, lower, is that yeah, right? Yeah, much lower, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we decided to update it. I had suggested looking at the Malibu schedule. Um, the Malibu schedule, we didn't really completely implement all the various components because they have a very complex schedule. Depends on the size of the film, exactly. how many crew members, mm -hmm. what time of day. 
And that was going to get too complex for staff to implement. But the actual fees they charged seemed to be a benchmark for us to, to um, weigh against what we would charge. And I guess what areas are involved, too, because there's some more picturesque areas here that people want to shoot at more than others. Yeah, that's true. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah, so it's, like I say, the coastline is most, most impacted because mm -hmm. that's the most popular. Um, and there's different categories for film versus television versus Commercial, still, right, yeah. still photography. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, in general, the uh, television and especially the uh, still photography have much less impact than right. films. Films take a while. All <laughs> kinds of staging areas you yes. have to have for crew and so on, and so, and uh, so they end up having to take up more space and so on. So the fee schedule kind of takes all that in consideration. Yeah, it was interesting. Last night I was I had the TV on, and all of a sudden I'm looking at a commercial, and yeah. I'm thinking that looks very familiar. And oh yes, it's right off of our, it's right down the street. I, I see it all the time. There was an ending segment for the Amazing Race, which I watched uh, for a while. Yeah, and it was right down here at the lighthouse. Uh, yes. down here, and so there's a lot of films over the years, and and especially uh, more recently, you see this as a background. Absolutely. Well, that's what happens when we have such a beautiful background. There's an old is. film called It's a Mad Mad World. Yeah. It's filmed over here in Peninsula. It's filmed at the Harden House down here in PB Drive South, and so it's 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 fun. It's, yeah, it's fun to see that. But we, we need to make sure that um, we um, don't impact the community too much with it. Right. You know? Yeah. And and I know that the update for the park plan in Lower Point Vicente. Where is that right now with the update? Well, <clears throat> the the Lower Point Vicente we address separately from the Parks Master Plan. Right. Not that it won't be in the Parks Master Plan eventually, but um, the the Lower Point Vicente was part of the Coastal Vision Plan. Okay. So we updated that within the Coastal Vision Plan. Um, the staff could have put together a draft and gone out to the public workshops on their own, but they decided that there were certain groups that had come up with alternative plans to the Annenberg proposal, which was there before, mm -hmm. and uh, they decided to bring some groups in that had alternative proposals and kind of come up with a conceptual draft that might have some of that input into it. The docents were part of that because they, they wanted to have the outdoor exhibits. Correct. Um, <clears throat> there was a California Native Plant Society that had a certain kind of uh, plan that they had for the area. Um, there was a citizens group that had an alternative plan for the area. Um, <clears throat> we want to include at least one homeowner from the ocean front of states, which, which uh, abuts the, the property there. Mm -hmm. I was involved as well because I knew much about the proposal before, and I'm a, a strong advocate of trying to protect our coastline. Of course. Um, <clears throat> so that was all put into kind of a conceptual plan. It went out to the public workshops. Mm -hmm. We got feedback from that, and we had the council agenda item come forth. We had a lot of feedback from the community from that. What kind of feedback were you getting from well, the community? Well, the... the Kind of the, the theme that was going through was people didn't really care for the outdoor exhibits. Okay. That was kind of, that was kind of the major component that we took out. Other than that, <clears throat> we, we just had kind of a natural, left in kind of a natural state with trail improvements and things of that, of that nature. Now, it doesn't mean down the road we can't consider other <clears throat> improvements, but for the time being, that's what the council decided. It's just to kind of leave it as a natural open area with some trails, and improvements there that are very simple benches and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we, we ended up at. It is one of the most naturally beautiful places it here. Is. And it people, is. I th guess they just want to walk around and just, you know, experience that. Right. And, and the, the idea was also uh, to have it uh, ocean-oriented. In other words, the whole Correct. interpretive center is about the ocean and right. so on. And so it was, it was for people to enjoy that beautiful site. Right. Now let's talk about the master plan with the parts. Okay. Uh, can you just briefly explain what the master plan is uh, and give us like a simple version of that? Yeah. Uh, the master plan is really just that. It's it's a master plan okay. for the parts. There are many, many parts but it, here. Sometimes it gets a little bit confusing <laughs> yeah. um, because we have a lot of individual plans. Right. I mentioned the coastal vision plan. Mm -hmm. We've got the conceptual trails plan. We have the bikes uh, trailway plans. We have the trails network plan, which kind of incorporates conceptual and bikes together. And then we have all these trails on the preserve. Mm -hmm, right. So what is our parks master plan? So um, the idea is to do two things. One, we went to council, or the staff went to council and says, do you want to make any changes to the current parks master plan on individual parks that are in our parks master plan? There's a few things that we did make some changes on, uh, but for the most part, we left them pretty much the way they were. 
Uh, the, the other part of this is the preserves are under a separate agreement under the Na uh, Natural Communities Conservation Plan, the NCCP. That's an agreement we have with the resource agencies, uh, of, uh, um, state uh, fish and wildlife and um, fish and game and the federal fish and wildlife. Okay. <clears throat> and so we have an agreement with them and, and the primary purpose of that NCCP, which we got the funding for to, mm -hmm. to acquire for public access, um, was preservation of habitat for threatened species. The secondary component to that, which is subject to the first part, is public access. Mm -hmm. In other words, the public access cannot negatively impact the first primary goal of preservation of habitat. Right. So um, we are in the, constantly in the process of trying to make sure we comply with that. So that is under a completely separate agreement, and so that will not be part of the park's master plan per se. Okay. Um, it may be mentioned in and may be, um, you know, referred to in the Parks Master Plan, but that will be a separate agreement. But, but other than that, all the other parks we have uh, will be part of the Parks Master Plan. And this has got to be a long, ongoing process, I would assume. Yeah, well, we went through the first vetting, which is, do we want to change any of the uses of the parks? And, uh, for instance, the what's called the Gateway Park. Mm -hmm. Originally, there was an equestrian center proposed there, maybe a parking lot, an entry point. The council decided for a variety of reasons that 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 should just be natural there because okay. there's there's landslide issues, there's fissures there, there's a whole lot of issues we had to address with that. So we decided to kind of nix the Gateway Park component down there, which is just off of PV Drive South as you enter into the preserve at the south side. Um, but other than that, most of the parks we uh, kept the same, really. Mm -hmm. What are the short term and the long term goals for that? The short term, like I say, is to, for the council, which we did, decide on do we want to make any changes. Okay. The long term goal is to take all of these various different plans we have and consolidate them into one uh, park, master parks plan. Like I say, the NCCP component where the preserves will be mentioned, but that will be mentioned as probably a separate agreement okay. and so on. But because uh, we don't. I mean, we, we don't have a whole lot of authority of putting ballparks in the preserve and yeah. things of that like that. Exactly. So that doesn't kind of fit into that same kind of category. And I know the council voted on some long-awaited enhancements to the Sunnyside Trail. Let's talk about that. Yeah, the Sunnyside Trail. That, that took quite a long time, uh, but there was a lot of complexity to it. Mm -hmm. There were two homes that were impacted as you enter from Sunnyside Ridge. So we wanted to make sure that the impact of them was minimalized. Right. Uh, it goes down a very steep canyon, so we needed to have retaining walls uh, there, and also uh, we needed to build a bridge. Right. And we don't city, see too many of those here. The city <laughs> has never been involved in bridges, although it's been suggested for the Portuguese Bend exactly. uh, landslide area, but uh, no, that's the first bridge. Anyway, th there was engineering and also impact of the community and design, and, and actually we had to discuss how it was going to end up in PB Drive East. W what happens when you end up over there, especially with like a horse? Mm -hmm. Is there something safe to get on, the, on that street? So we had right. to engineer and design it very well. Had a lot of community input. Uh, we have the buy-in from the two homeowners, finally. And uh, um, in the, at the end of all of that long process, we ended up with a project that everybody's happy with. And how has the community reacted to that? They, they, they came, there's several people that came, the equestrian and a hiker came to the um, meeting and they said they're very happy with the final result. That's great, yeah. that's also, also good. Now, what is skateboard bombing, Jim? Let's talk about that. That is a good <laughs> question. <laughs> I didn't know until yesterday. <laughs> yeah, it's not an easy thing to define. But it is a safety issue yes. uh, within the city and also um, our, our sister city, San Pedro, mm -hmm. uh, L.A. down there has had some issues with it as well. It's a, it's a safety issue. So basically what we did was we put together an ordinance, but we, we in the ordinance, tried to define what we felt was unsafe skateboarding, quote, bombing. And, um, and that's basically when, when people on skateboards are sort of Going down a hill, is that right? At You're a going very down fast the hill speed. At a fast speed. And yeah. I'll kind of read to you some of the components okay. we had. Uh, it, there are rides at excessive speeds that are not safe for street conditions. Uh, rides with a wanton disregard for the safety of other persons or property. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really left up to the sheriff's uh, expertise and observations as to whether a kid is operating skateboard uh, unsafely or not. Right. And, and, and so we have this ordinance can be enforced. 
Uh, we also prohibited uh, um, skateboards from uh, hanging on the end of cars and trucks and things like that. That's not safe as well. No. That's all part of that. So um, Captain Boland uh, has looked at the ordinance. He says it's enforceable. And again, it depends on the expertise and the observations of the deputies at any given time. And um, the other component that, that parents need to know is they're held responsible for underage kids. If oh, there's a fine or, or something addressed there, that, that the parents are held responsible. We've been talking about a skate park for years here. Mm -hmm. where, where are we with that? Well, the council has decided to include that in the Parks Master Plan for the Upper Point Vicente area. Okay. Um, there are a lot of things to still work out with that. Um, where's the exact location? Uh, how is it going to be managed? Uh, in other words, if you want to have restricted hours, you don't want to have kids skateboarding at midnight or 2 a.m., you, you may have to fence it off. I, I don't know. I, there needs to be some kind of management of, of the area. Um, and there's just a slew of questions to be worked out as to actually implementing it. The council's approved it. Are there other locations they're still looking into, or? Uh, no, no, they decided not to look at any of the locations. Okay, no. right. no, they, they, they pretty much decided on this. I mean, there are other potential locations, uh, but um, uh, I think, but uh, no, they decided this is the only possible place. Well, we'll see how that all works out. Yeah, that yeah. works. Yeah. Now, uh, Carolyn Petro, as we have talked about before, is retiring after many, many years as our deputy city manager. Right. And that job has been posted. Do you sort of see this as um, the new person coming in, an ongoing, a long ongoing search, or how does that work? Well, um, just so people understand, the decision to have a deputy city manager is not a council decision. Okay. It's a decision exclusively that the city manager... Uh, him or herself would, would decide, in this case, Doug or Wilmore, mm -hmm. our, our city manager. He's decided he'd like to have an assistant city manager. So he's putting the search out. Okay. He's keeping us informed of the progress of that and so on. Um, but it's, it's his choice. Um, I, it just makes me think how much I really will miss yes. Carolyn Petru. She has been a terrific asset to the city. She has a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge of the city. She's, she's uh, done a job as um, uh, deputy, in, interim uh, city, city manager, manager for, right. for a full year and been deputy for many years, for almost 30 years, almost. So I, I, I'm going to greatly miss her. Yes, and I don't envy somebody trying to replace somebody who's been here for <laughs> all that time and yeah. meant so much to our city, that's for mm -hmm. sure. So, Jim, finally, before we go, what have you been up to these days? Tell us about what you're doing. Well, a lot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I know. being mayor, I'm placed on a whole bunch of boards and, and different organizations regionally beyond the city. Mm -hmm. um, I've just been elected vice president, uh, first vice president of the South Bay COG. And so the South Bay COG, is, we're, I'm working hard with them to try and get some... Um, uh, some transportation funds for Measure R for our, for our city. Um, not only for, to improve the transportation off the hill that people can use for commuting to work, but along Western Avenue, I've been pushing hard to get that on the project list with Measure R funding. Finally got successful with that with South Bay COG. Um, and so um, we are in the process now of, of going out and trying to, to set a project we can get funding for okay. that will improve, basically the fundamental uh, project will improve the traffic through their uh, uh, traffic signalization, uh, syn synchronization, and uh, other, other elements to improve the, the traffic flow through there. You know what? You could probably be at an event every day and every night. How do you sort of pick which ones you can go to? <laughs> I have to choose. Sometimes I do have to choose between two events. Oh, yeah, sure. I just, I, 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 I'm here to serve the people, whatever serves <laughs> the people best. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> well, you certainly do that very well. Jim Knight, thank you so much for being with us and going over everything that's been going on in our good city here. Appreciate having you. My pleasure. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Maria Sorreo, and we will see you next time on City Talk.